Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. You're listening to episode 125 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're answering more of your weird questions. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So, Jimmy, what questions are you going to be answering today? We're going to be looking at questions like, if people move to Mars and die and are buried there, what will happen at the resurrection of the dead? Will they be living on Mars? We'll look at what would happen if we found the Ark of the Covenant. Could you touch it safely? We'll be talking about what was Jesus's religion. We'll be answering a question from a person who says, the idea of aliens scares him, and if they exist, what implications would that have for the existence of God. We'll also be looking at things like why in some places you can eat capybara, which is a mammal during Lent, and also at the implications of hyperfertility and whether, what could be done in response to a person who is hyperfertile. So a bunch of weird stuff to talk about. Excellent. Given that it's almost Halloween, I would suggest people go on YouTube and do yourself a favor and watch some videos of capybaras eating pumpkins. It is the cutest thing ever. Uh, oh, neat. <laughs> that's my tip. <laughs> oh, also, speak, speaking of Halloween, because people often have questions about this. Now, we don't talk about it in this episode, but I've talked about Halloween before and whether it's OK to dress up in scary costumes and things like that. So you can also Google Jimmy Aiken Halloween and a number of resources will come up for you. Awesome. Awesome. What are my favorite holidays? All right. Uh, so, folks, enjoy these questions and then we'll be right back after. We get uh, lots of questions uh, via many methods here uh, at Catholic Answers, and uh, Jimmy collects up uh, the weirdest, and we get to them about, you know, every five, six weeks we get to them. Uh, the first question, uh, I'm going to go with the question from Darren. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Darren, you're the boss here, except when we're on the air and I'm the boss. So get on that <laughs> microphone and ask your question of Jimmy. Go, there oh, you go. Here we go. He, Darren does not like getting on the microphone. So, oh, but, a little shy. That's endearing. Uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I had to put my headphones on. <laughs> okay. Okay, I had a question. Um, you know how in the Old Covenant, if you touched the Ark of the Covenant, you would um, be... Um, you know, like Uz, Uz, Uzzah struck by lightning Uzzah. or, mm -hmm. or Uzza died. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so say, just say they've, they found the ark. It's still here mm -hmm. on earth and they found it just hypothetically. Say in a warehouse. Yeah, maybe. Okay. And, uh, would that rule still apply? Could you, could you touch the ark or would it, it kind of be, uh, like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. So the answer is we can't know for sure. Um, I mean, God could choose to still do that. However, the fact that he uh, he did send his son to fulfill and thus abrogate the old covenant uh, could indeed mean that um, that the supernatural aspects of the ark were canceled at that point. It would still be a holy object in that it was consecrated to God, but it wouldn't have the same supernatural effects because the Christian, because God's covenant has taken a different direction through Jesus Christ. Um, and in fact, that may actually be indicated in the book of Revelation, where John sees in chapter 12, uh, or at the end of chapter 11, he sees the ark 
in God's temple in heaven, which uh, some interpreters have looked at and said, this is a sign that the earthly ark has been superseded. Mm -hmm. And now the spiritual realities that the ark pointed to are to be seen as being fulfilled uh, in, in God's temple in heaven in a heavenly way rather than in an earthly way. So you could even appeal to that passage to back up the idea that the ark wouldn't have supernatural manifestations today if we found it. Also, I have just a little personal uh, bit of uh, it's kind of related to this. Uh, If you go to Jerusalem today and you go to the Temple Mount, we know that the Temple Mount is where Solomon's Temple and later Herod's Temple stood. But there's a debate about exactly where was the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies located, which is where the Ark was housed. And um, according to one theory, it's the 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 rock that's in the Dome of the Rock. Um, but, and, I, and I've been in the Dome of the Rock, and I've even been under the rock. There's a little grotto under oh. there um, that you can go down or could go down into. I don't think they let you do that anymore. But so I've been there. I've touched that. Um, but the, the, there's a significant argument that the actual location was not the rock, that that was like the alt, that was where the sacrifices were done. Mm-hmm. But where the actual sanctuary, the Holy of Holies was, was this other place, which also has a kind of rock. It's out in the open air. Um and it's uh, kind of to one side of the Dome of the Rock. And while I was there, I trepidatiously touched what may have been the sanctuary and I didn't die. So oh. uh, so we've actually tested this. <laughs> well, <laughs> to, up to a point, Lord Copper. So so maybe, but those we don't really know. We'd have to wait until we found the Ark. But uh, but uh, those are some pointers. Uh, excellent question, Darren. Excellent weird question. Perfectly in the spirit of weird questions uh, with Jimmy Aiken. John uh, has the first Internet uh, question today. Uh, following our first question from producer Darren, uh, John asks, Jimmy, if people move to Mars mm-hmm. and die and are buried there, when the end times come and they are in their glorified body, will they be living on Mars? back on earth with the rest of us or someplace else? It depends on what God chooses to do. Um, The way that the book of Revelation and other passages depict the final state of mankind is in a situation that's referred to as the new heavens and the new earth. And some people have understood that to mean um, the abolition complete annihilation of the present heavens and earth or the present physical universe. But that's actually not how the church understands it. The church understands it to be more, and it's not really definitive about this, but the church, you look carefully at the language the church uses, it suggests not the annihilation of the present heavens and earth, but their renovation. So an upgraded state. Okay. And, um, The question would then be, and and there's another possibility, too, which is you could say, okay, uh, even if God doesn't annihilate this universe, he creates a new one and we kind of move from one universe to the other. Yeah. Um, So all three of those are possibilities. If we go with the understanding that there's a like upgrade, we know the upgrade would apply here on Earth because we're told that. Um, And the extent to which it would affect things off of Earth is unclear. I mean, the language says a new heavens, which would apply, suggest an upgrade there. But since heaven is really a spiritual reality, um, it, that may be what's under discussion. It's like there won't be any more bad spirits roaming around. God and man are going to be united. The angels will all be in their final state, too. And so mm-hmm. it may be more of a spiritual renovation rather than a f- some other kind of change in the physical universe. Um, So it might or might not apply to Mars. But since the human race is a unity, um, my suspicion, my understanding would be that whatever God chooses to do is going to apply to all humans. So um, if God chose to completely annihilate the physical universe and create a new one, the people from Mars would come to that new one just like us. If he left it alone and created a new one and moved us over, he would move the Marsies over too. The Marsies? And yeah, okay. the term from science fiction. Okay. And um, and if 
we stayed in this universe, but he upgraded Earth. I suspect the upgrade would either apply to Mars or the Marsies would be reunited with us on the new Earth. But uh, those are guesses. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, it, it, behind that question is the assumption that human. Well, I guess not an assumption. He says if people move to Mars. Right. And uh, there's an, a growing a number of quite vocal scientists are saying people are never going to live on Mars, that it's never going to happen, that it's well, like living in Ar- Antarctica. People will visit and have bases. But yeah, they're, they're but not having live. a base is, if it's an ongoing base, it's living on Mars. Yeah. No. Um, well, like, like you live, like these people now go like down to Antarctica for a year yeah. or something, that kind of thing. On the other hand, if you read some of those articles carefully, they're saying, we're not going to anytime soon. Yeah. But given hundreds or thousands of years, we could terraform it and right. things like that. Right. Uh, all right. So the Marsies, not the Martians, mm-hmm. get to come home or we'll yeah. see, you know. Well, the humans, humans get to be called Martians in uh, Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. Uh-huh. All right. I'm, uh, uh, Nancy um, uh, sent this question, Jimmy. Okay. Is there anything recorded about Jesus doing any personal care of himself, like wa- like we wash, comb our hair, or brush our teeth, et cetera? Yes. Um, so it, it's going to depend in part on what you count as personal care. But obviously, the scriptures record Jesus sleeping, which okay. is a form of personal care. They record him eating, which uh-huh. is a form of personal care. They record him um, drinking which mm-hmm. is a form of personal care beyond that in terms of, and those are human universals that everybody has to do. Right. Um, but beyond that, uh, we have uh, Jesus having his feet washed. Right. Right. And that was a standard part of hygiene and courtesy mm-hmm. back in, in their culture. Um, he also talks about um, when you fast, wash your face So people, you don't look miserable for people. Right. So that would suggest Jesus washed his face. Mm -hmm. Um, We see Jesus taking time to go be alone and pray. So that's like taking personal time. Right. Um, We also see Jesus uh, engaging in a form of personal care that we don't tend to do today. He was anointed. Oh. Um, anointing was a form of personal care where they would take an oil of often a perfumed oil and and they would pour it over you. So you'd smell nice mm-hmm. and have this pleasing oil texture and stuff. Um, and uh, and so we see that happening as well. And that was also a, a part of hospitality yeah. back in their culture. And so, yeah, we see Jesus uh, doing things now. He probably didn't have a toothbrush. Because toothbrushes had not been invented yet, but what people would do, I mean, they uh, we've had toothpicks forever, yeah. you know, because people get stuck in their teeth, people yeah. get things stuck in their teeth, they hate that. So mankind invented the toothpick really early. But uh, before we had toothbrushes, they had what are now called chew sticks. Um, which was a stick and you kind of chew on one end of it to make to rough it up and then you'd use that to clean your teeth. Ah. So uh, so that was an, a normal thing at the time. So Jesus, like everybody else, may have been using chew sticks. Nancy, thank you very, very much uh, for that question. Uh, let's go on to our next. Oh, oh also, there are lots of uh, washing rituals in first century Judaism. Right. Jesus wasn't as insistent on them as other people were, uh, not for their ceremonial reason, but for just cleanliness hygiene reasons, he presumably would have used them. Uh, Mary's question is next. Mm-hmm. Did the two men who were crucified alongside Jesus also have to carry their crosses to Calvary? Uh, or was Jesus the only one to do this? We're only told that that Jesus did it, it doesn't really address. I don't believe the other two either way, but I would presume that they did. Um, They presumably would have used the same form of crucifixion for everybody they were crucifying that day. There were different forms of crucifixion. um, And in some of them, you had to carry the the cross beam, the tibulum, to the vertical stake, and then they'd hoist you up. Um, And uh, if if that seems to be what they're doing with Jesus, and so I would assume they did the same thing with the other two criminals. Uh, Mary, uh, thank you very, very much for that question. Um, Oh, but they didn't get anyone else to carry them because they hadn't been 
abused to the way Jesus had been and to where he physically couldn't carry it. Uh, yeah, and and uh, this practice of crucifixion, what did it just ha- happen in that part of the empire? Or was this? Oh no, 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 no! no. This is empire. all over. This was a standard, and it's not just in the Roman Empire, but the Romans used it uh, in their empire. We know of other cases. Sometimes thousands of people could be crucified at once. One of the uh, one interesting case of crucifixion occurred a few decades before Jesus, about almost 100 years before Jesus's crucifixion. Um, Julius Caesar was kidnapped at one point. This was before he was a leader. Uh, He was a young man. He was kidnapped by some pirates and held for ransom. And this was a common thing. You'd kidnap rich people, even kings. That's where we get the phrase, a king's ransom. Oh, Because you yeah. like in the Crusades, you'd capture a king, you'd ransom him off to let, release him, and you get the king's ransom. Well, Julius Caesar wasn't uh, uh, at the head of state yet. He was a young man, but he got kidnapped by pirates. And they had him on this island while they were waiting for his ransom to be delivered. And he was like joking around with them, telling them, you know, I'm going to, after I, after I get out of here, I'm going to come back and kill all of you. <laughs> and, and they thought he was joking. Mm-hmm. And after he... Um, had his ransom paid, he he mounted a uh, a navy and came back and killed all of them by crucifixion. <laughs> well, Caesar's a man of his word, In I guess. In that case, he was, yeah. Um, uh, okay, we go now to uh, David's question. David asks, uh, what religion was Jesus? And he adds this comment, question asked of me by a Muslim. It's a question that is going to depend on how you define your terms. In one sense, you can say Jesus was a Jew, and he certainly was Jewish ethnically, but he also ex- embraced the Jewish faith. But he went beyond the um, standard understanding of the Jewish faith at his time. He was also a prophet and came to bring new divine revelation, which completed Judaism. And so if by a Jew, you mean someone who had the standard understanding of Judaism that was limited to the Old Testament revelation, he wasn't a Jew in that sense, um, because he he brought the Jewish religion to its fulfillment. Um, so you, you can say he's a Jew, but he's not an ordinary Jew. In terms of, is he a Christian? The term Christian is normally used to mean a follower of Christ. And if that's how you're using it, he wouldn't technically count as a Christian because he's not a follower of himself. Okay. He's he's the founder and leader of Christianity. But if you use the term Christian to just mean someone who proclaims the Christian faith, yes. then, well, he proclaimed the Christian faith, so right. he's a Christian in that sense. So uh, like a lot of people, including the apostles, you could say he was a Jewish Christian. All right. Fair enough. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to add my own weird question to this, okay. because sometimes you hear nowadays people saying, well, basically, Jesus was a Buddhist. Is <laughs> is um, is there any evidence that Buddhism was known or that he could have been exposed to Buddhism or there's there was contact. So Buddhism is a religion that originally came from India, but it largely died out in India mm-hmm. and it it survived in lands farther east than India. Okay. There had been contact by this point with India and the West. Alexander the Great, yep. in fact, went as far in the 300s BC, went as far as India, but didn't stay. Um, his generals said, we've had enough of this after 10 years on the road. Right. Um, but there were some trade relations, and it's not impossible that some knowledge of Buddhism could have could have been exchanged, but... I am unaware of any really good evidence for it. Um, In terms of Jesus, the idea of Jesus being a Buddhist is utterly contradicted by the actual evidence. So if you look at the historical Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the man who founded it, um, he said, uh, we don't know if there are any gods. We're agnostic on that question. Uh, But 
the afterlife involves a recurrent cycle of reincarnation that involves suffering, and we need to get out of that cycle. Mm -hmm. This was his big deal. Uh, Desire leads to suffering and reincarnation and so forth, so you need to get rid of your desires and achieve nirvana. His, he, he, he really was not interested in the question of are there gods. Um, his analogy was if you've been shot by an arrow, yeah. the urgent thing is to get the arrow out, not debate other questions. And so we've been shot by suffering. We need to get rid of the suffering, not worry about gods. Now, later Buddhists reintroduced the idea of gods. And okay. so you have different sects of Buddhism. Some of them are atheistic or agnostic. Some of them are religious, believe, are religious believe in gods, but yeah. all of them are religious in that they accept reincarnation. Okay. So... What So we've got the two key elements of religion, uh, belief about the divine and belief about the afterlife. Well, the uh, Theravada Buddhists who follow Siddhartha Gautama's teachings, they're agnostic or atheistic on the first question. The others are polytheistic. Mm-hmm. On the afterlife, all of them are reincarnationists. Yeah. So let's look at Jesus. Did Was Jesus... An atheist or agnostic? No. Was he a polytheist? At, absolutely not. Did he believe in reincarnation? No. Okay, so Jesus disagreed with all schools of Buddhism yeah. on the two central subjects of religion, the divine and the afterlife. Jesus was no Buddhist. Ah, uh, I see. Um uh, I guess maybe that's a way of uh, dismissing Jesus in a way. Uh, if, I don't... if you're a Buddhist, I don't know, maybe. But if you're a Christian, it could be the reverse. It could be a way of excluding Buddhism from consideration. Yeah, no, but I mean the person who says, like the contemporary Westerner who goes, oh, oh Jesus is just a, another Buddhist or, you know, it's obvious that the, I think there anyone who says it, they it's, just don't it's, know. it's obvious you don't know what you're talking about if you say that. Yeah. Yeah. You either don't know Christianity or Buddhism or both. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Rose asks this question to me. Uh, and um, I realize that we're coming up to the break, but I want to give you the question because it would be a good teaser for the. OK, if, if you don't have to, if you, if you have time, that's fine. But mm-hmm. Rose says aliens scare me. Don't know why. It's rather irrational. If they exist, is there a God? Did he also create them? OK, so uh, I know we're running up against the end of the clock. So and she's got I, some sub questions, I gather. Uh, yes, right. But uh, she starts with aliens scare her. Mm hmm. I wonder if that they, they're not always well depicted. They're not always depicted in a friendly way in no, the media. <laughs> and any, any time you meet somebody new, it can be a little scary, especially if yeah. they're not human. Right. And if they have powers mm-hmm. that you don't have. Like yeah. I, I when I was like a they child. Like can see an ultraviolet or something. Yeah. Like like bees. Yeah. Uh, bees well, are actually taking bees over more sen- see an infrared. I don't oh, know really? about ultraviolet. Yeah. But like when I was a kid, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I remember being in like first and second grade and uh, I was actually afraid of giants. Oh, like I thought, what if there are giants like that just seemed like Mm -hmm. like that would be very, very bad. They could squash you. Yeah. Like that. Or I was always scared of the part where you could run and hide from them, but they could just lift up anything you were hiding under. That terrified me. There was a TV show at the time that you may have seen. Oh, I might have seen that. Erwin Allen's Land of the Giants. I wonder if I. Yeah. Her question confessed to being scared of aliens and uh, asks if they exist, is there a God or if they exist, did he also create them? So if there are aliens and I assume by that she means intelligent aliens. OK. Um, you know, like not like alien microbes or plants or something. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, God is over the entire universe. So the existence of God can be proved in a variety of different ways. Um, it, it has nothing to do with aliens. So if aliens exist, they would just be another creature that uh, God uh, produced just like he produced us. He may have used, you know, the forces of evolution on their planet, like People say he used the forces of evolution on our planet to make the life that's here. Yeah. But it's all under God's providential control. So if there are aliens, uh, God made them just like he made us. They're fellow creatures of God. That all doesn't right. mean they're not scary because oh, yeah. some, some creatures of God are scary, like, you know, bears. You yeah. got an enraged bear in the woods. You uh, you that's something to be scared of. So you have an enraged alien that could be scary, too. But fortunately, aliens are much farther away from us than bears. 
So we have relative protection in that regard. So if you don't have to be worried about a bear breaking into your home, you probably don't have to worry about aliens too much either. But what, wouldn't it be awesome if the alien ship lands, they come out, mm-hmm. and it's bears? They're just yeah, super uh-huh. smart, advanced Ursuline bears. aliens. Ursuline. Yeah, that's, that's, been, that's been done in science fiction. <laughs> oh, bears has? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Also flying squirrels. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that seems more realistic, actually. Yeah. So she has, I gather, some sub-questions regarding the aliens. So why don't we take a look at those? Well, if they exist, is there a god? Yep. Um, did he also create god? Okay, yep. and how are they to be evangelized if they are culturally godless well we can certainly tell them about what god did for our race and it may or may not be possible for them to be saved through becoming christians Uh, god may have other provisions for them they might be unfallen they might not need to be saved um, you know, like if the Adam and Eve of their race had never fell. Um, incidentally, you mentioned my uh, podcast, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. By coincidence, in two weeks, so not this Friday, but two Fridays from now, I have a long requested episode coming out on the implications of intelligent aliens for religion so we like deep dive into this question and cover a bunch of things so check out jimmy aiken's mysterious world episode 55 coming up in two weeks will be all about the theological implications of intelligent aliens Uh, do you want some more for yeah sure let's let's wrap up hers okay so she also asked what if they have a fundamentally different understanding of god like mormons or jehovah's witnesses well it would mean they're wrong um just like mormons or jehovah's witnesses what if they were bears and Jehovah's Witnesses. They'd be going up and down the street, bears, uh-huh. knocking on your door. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. That's okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, aliens, intelligent aliens would be, I mean, they would be different than us, but they would be basically just other people. Mm-hmm. So it's like when you meet other people here on Earth that have different religious views, you don't have to be scared of that. It doesn't mean that your religion is wrong or theirs must be right. Um, You have to look at the evidence and the evidence supports Christianity. So if we met aliens, uh, they might have had contact with God and they might have, um, you know, things God has told them. Uh, which would be fascinating to learn about, but they could also just be wrong, just like meeting other people here on Earth. They're not automatically right. Yep. All right. And um, um, okay, I'm going to read this one all as one. Uh, okay. Could they be able to tell us if our God is one of a race of gods? Uh, she says, like the Gnostics, mm-hmm. um, if God is part of a race of gods who all stand outside of time, do we have the right one? And are we invincibly ignorant of worshiping others to the detriment of our salvation? OK, so uh, the fundamental premise there is the idea that our God might be part of a race of gods. Mm-hmm. And that is not possible. Um, the uh, reality in order to be a single reality, has to have a fundamental ground. Philosophers and theologians sometimes call it the ground of being. Mm -hmm. And if you had two gods, they would have to have, in order for them to relate to each other, like be part of a race, they would have to have some underlying reality that provides a framework they exist within. And that and that okay. and so there would be something more fundamental than the gods. Yeah. And we know by a variety of means that our God is actually the fundamental ground of all being that grounds everything else. So it's not possible to have more than one fundamental ground of being to reality. There can be only one mm-hmm. and therefore there can be only one ultimate God. Uh, Rose gets the idea, though. That was mm-hmm. that was a lot of good, weird stuff. Um, and, and a very interesting, Rose. Thank you very, very much. It is Weird Questions uh, with Jimmy Aiken this hour on Catholic Answers Live. Steve asks this, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Is method acting an evil character generally seen as dangerous and possibly immoral, perhaps along similar lines as par- participating in hypnosis. I am thinking of the issues Jim Carrey had recovering from playing Andy Kaufman and Heath Ledger uh, from The Joker. Mm-hmm. So um, for people who may not be aware, method acting is a form of acting where the actor will deeply immerse himself in the uh, thought of the character he's playing. And even uh, if I'm not mistaken, off camera, 
will stay or off stage will stay in character yeah. and just think right. through the lens of how would my character react to this constantly. And the idea is by immersing yourself that deeply in the thought of a character, you're going to portray the character better. Um, the I would say a couple things. The first one is we want to distinguish this from the situation of hypnosis. Um, hypnotists, and there, for a couple of reasons, even hypnotists will tell you hypnotism does not in it does not cause you to do anything you wouldn't do normally mm -hmm. um, or be willing to do normally, although it does give you a kind of social permission to act weird, you know, mm -hmm. like cluck like a chicken or whatever. Um, I don't think hypnosis is actually a different state of consciousness at all. I think it's a social role mm -hmm. that we play. Um, if you, And if you want to hear about that, check out the recent episode of hypnosis on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. But... Uh, setting the issue of hypnosis aside, I think method acting for an evil character can be dangerous. Um, you can put yourself too deeply into the thought of a bad person. And, um, and it, it's like when people are getting ready to do something they know is wrong, they talk themselves into it. They start to immerse themselves oh. in the mind of a person who, who would, do, would do this yeah. and wouldn't view it as bad. And so when people are rationalizing a sin they're about to commit, mm -hmm. they're doing something very much like method acting a bad character. And so I would say that um, it, while it's OK and even necessary as an actor to think about what would my character do? You want to maintain a certain kind of clinical detachment from, yeah. from that character. And if you identify too much with a disordered thought process, yeah, that's going to be bad. You're, yeah. you're, you're, if you're fully immersing yourself in disordered thought that uh, leads to sinful behavior, absolutely, that can, uh, that, that's a bad thing. Yeah, the, we're more vulnerable or, or uh, people don't always appreciate how vulnerable you are. But mm -hmm. if you think a certain way, you, yeah. you're you not a superhero. You right. I mean, Jesus, as Jesus said, it's not just the physical act of adultery. It, if you look at a woman lustfully, yeah. you're doing it in your heart. And in the same way, if you are immersing yourself in a character and think, oh, my character would so much love to do this bad thing. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah. you know, right. well, OK, you, you you may be doing it in your heart right now. Yeah. I was just preparing for a role. Uh, oh, well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, Stacy asks this. Well, and she gives a piece of information that I did not know. Okay. Why? <laughs> why does capybara? Oh, sure. Not count as meat during Lent. I did not know that. It's uh -huh. like saying you can eat gerbils and hamsters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, capybara, for people who may not be aware, are the are rodents of unusual size. <laughs> Right. Of stature. Rodents yeah. of stature. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> rodents of unusual size is from the Princess Bride. Yeah. yeah. And they're not quite as big as the ones in the Princess Bride, though. They get, you know, about yay big, kind of yeah. small pig size. Um, and they live in Brazil and Venezuela and other parts of South America. And they're very cute. Their capybara are so, so cute. Um, but they... Um, are permitted, or at least historically have been permitted, as a meat option during Lent in those areas. And the reason is um, they are semi-aquatic. That's mm -hmm. the difference between them and gerbils and hamsters. Gerbils and hamsters are not semi-aquatic, but capybara are. So they'll live in like rivers and stuff. And so when the uh, natives in those lands were being evangelized, and, you know, they're being baptized into the Catholic faith and they're saying, OK, now that we're Catholics, what can we eat in Lent? Well, you can eat things that live in water, fish. Yeah. Oh, well, capybara live, capybara live in water. Can we eat them? And it was judged pastorally prudent to allow them to count capybara as uh, water dwellers for purposes of uh, evangelizing their culture. Um and uh, because it would remove a barrier between them and God to be able to eat what they regarded as a water dwelling thing. Right. Um, it wouldn't make any so, sense if you if if they're thinking of it as a water dwelling animal and the yeah. rule is you can eat water dwelling animals, then it right. would make no sense to. 
Right. And so even though from a modern biological perspective, we'd say, okay, they're mammals, not fish. Yeah. Um, they are water dwellers. And there's a similar thing that happened here in the United States. In Michigan, there has historically been a permission for exactly the same reasons to allow muskrat um, oh. to be eaten during Lent in Michigan. You know, I had thought it was someone had said it was beavers, but um, I have but, heard beavers as well. Beavers but, obviously also are aquatic. I mean, they make the dams and stuff. Right. Here, watch your language. Um, they um, no in. Oh, <laughs> they uh, you could eat muskrat mm -hmm. because it was a water. But that's interesting. All right. Well, thank you very, very much for that question, uh, Stacy. I didn't know that you could eat uh, capybara uh, during Lent. Uh, but I actually think they're that so might be cute, a, though. Are they really? Yeah, they're really cute. Oh, all right. Not really um, a rodent guy. Right, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including John D., Kathy B., Teresa M., Christopher P., Alan P., and Corey S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at aaronv.com. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. Uh, Pat, uh, by email, asks the following. The Fermi Paradox asks the question, if we're not alone in the universe, where is everybody else? Catholic doctrine, of course, doesn't exclude the possibility of material, rational cre creatures. However, we terrestrial humans are the only ones we know of. Is there anything in Catholic doctrine that suggests an answer to the Fermi paradox? By the way, while baptized as an infant, Enrico Fermi was agnostic. All right. Yeah. So Enrico Fermi was a famous 20th century physicist. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he is famous, among other things, for having, in discussing the question of aliens, asked well, where is everybody? Yeah. And that's the Fermi paradox. If if alien life is all over the place, why don't intelligent alien life? Why don't we see it? Yeah. Guess what? We have an episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Are you kidding yeah, me? On the Fermi paradox. Oh, OK. Um, but so you can look that up for more detail. There's nothing in Catholic doctrine that settles this one way or another. The church does not have a teaching about whether there are aliens or whether there aren't or why we don't see them if there are all over the place. Um, so there's nothing in Catholic doctrine. That's not the same thing, though, as theology. Um, theology <clears throat> involves opinions about things rather than things the church authoritatively teaches. And there are principles that people have proposed theologically that um, that can have a bearing on this question. Some uh, want to say, OK, mankind is central in the universe, uh, unique among God's physical creatures in such a way that would preclude there being other similar life forms in the physical universe. Okay. That's a theological opinion, not a church teaching. Got it. But it would address the Fermi paradox because it would mean there aren't other intelligent life forms out there. Other people would appeal to a different uh, theological principle, which is sometimes called the principle of plenitude or fullness, that God, to manifest his glory, kind of explores the full the full range of of all the different things he can do as ways of showing his glory. And so he makes all kinds of life here on earth. He makes spiritual beings like angels and the principle of plenitude, you could argue, would suggest there are loads of alien, intelligent aliens out there and life on other planets and things like that, in which case that uh, also has a bearing on the Fermi paradox, the issue of why don't we see them uh, more commonly than is reported or, you know, why hasn't one of them already 
colonized the whole galaxy or something if they've really been there for millions of years. Um, but both the principle of mankind's uniqueness and the principle of plenitude as theological principles would have a bearing on this question. But neither one of these is, it has been embraced by church teaching in such a way as to answer the Fermi paradox. All right, uh, Pat, thank you very much for the question. Uh, here's the one I've been looking forward to, Jimmy. I want uh -huh. to know the answer to this. Mark asks, would Luke Skywalker have to denounce his Jedi religion to become a Catholic? It depends on... A couple of things. Now, first thing we have to do is stipulate that the stuff we see in the Star Wars movies is real because, okay. you know, like Luke Skywalker and the force and yeah. things like that. And then we have to evaluate it in terms of is it a religion? Well, um, we certainly in the Star Wars movies have it described as a religion. Um, oh. You have, uh, you know, in right in the very first movie, episode four, you have, who is it, Admiral Mott talking to Darth Vader and saying, oh. your sad devotion to that ancient religion, uh, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And then Darth Vader telepathically or telekinetically chokes him and says, I find your lack of faith disturbing, yeah. which is an awesome line. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the uh, if, if it's really a religion, yeah. then yes, Luke Skywalker would have to renounce Jedi in order to become Catholic, if it's really a different religion, um, because it would have principles that are inconsistent with the Christian faith. On the other hand, if you as you watch the series going along, it even though they use religious trappings for this, like they have Jedi temples and things like that, <clears throat> they don't seem to be worshiping any gods. And they do have some kind of possibility of survival in the afterlife yeah. because you can have force ghosts, but we've stipulated those are real. So that was one of our, that was our initial stipulation. Oh, okay. Right. So, and there's nothing to say that a ghost, someone being able to become a ghost. Right. Is, or is contrary to the Catholic faith. Right. Exactly. So okay. that's not automatically ruled out. Um, and as you watch the series and you, you start to study, well, what's the nature of the force? Well, we're told it's an energy field oh. and it's an energy field that is uh, capable of interacting. And I know this is controversial, but it's in it's in Star Wars canon. It's capable of interacting with um, with life on the subcellular level because your midichlorians uh -huh. um, are what put you in contact with the force. So I don't even like to talk about midichlorians. I, okay? I know it's painful. <laughs> I don't either. Right. But since the question has been asked, yeah. it looks to me like there's a significant case to be made that even though Star Wars dresses up the force in religious trappings, it's really a natural phenomenon right. that interacts with people biologically. Mm -hmm. And so if it existed, I think you could argue that Luke Skywalker might not so much need to renounce Jediism as reinterpret Jediism as a natural phenomenon, kind of like the way uh, people used to... Um, view astronomy through the lens of astrology, like the heavens control everything. Oh, and, right. Well, OK, to an extent, you have a supernova is too close. It's going to affect things. Right. But you can purify it of the mystical occult things and look at the core science underneath the astronomy. Right. I think you could argue if the Star Wars stuff was real, you could purify the Jedi and Sith religions of their erroneous trappings and look at the core natural phenomenon underneath. Uh, all right. Very interesting. Mark, thank you for that question. Uh, Claire's got a long one, so I will um, <clears throat> edit it a little bit, but you tell okay. me if, if I'm, if I'm missing something that you wanted to get to in Catholic women's internet land, I sometimes hear from women who experience mm -hmm. something like hyper fertility. Mm -hmm. They claim to have attempted every form of NFP out there. Uh, including Marquette, which seems to be the scientific gold standard. Well, I suppose there's a debate about that and still wind up unintentionally pregnant at times when they were very carefully trying uh, to avoid it. Uh, so her question is, hypothetically, if researchers were to identify a medical cause for this condition and a treatment could be found which could reduce <clears throat> fertility to normal level levels, not eliminating fertility altogether and make it possible for these women to successfully use NFP to avoid pregnancy, would that be a licit 
treatment? Uh, we'd have to look at the actual treatment in question, okay. but in principle, I think the answer would be yes. Um, what medical science can do legitimately is correct imbalances um, in uh, in human function, biological functioning. And those imbalances can either be in terms of excess or defect, so too much or too little. Mm-hmm. So let's say your heart is beating too slow. Yeah. You could take adrenaline or have a pacemaker or something to speed up your heart to where right. it needs to be. Similarly, let's suppose you have the opposite problem. Let's suppose you have tachycardia. Your heart is beating way too fast. Right. Okay. Well, you could take beta blockers to slow it down okay. to a normal range that's healthy. And so if some people, just like some uh, women have diminished fertility or men, there are pers- things they can do to raise their fertility to a normal level. And if they had hyperfertility where they they're they're just oh. like pumping out ova all the time, right. which is not God's design for a human woman. You could theoretically use a treatment to bring it down to the normal range, just like you could speed up or slow down your heartbeat to a normal, healthy range. Right. Oh, that's very, very. OK. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, that would be my take. Claire. Uh-huh. Um, but that, but no such. Uh, I mean, she, this has had a lot of ifs in it. Yeah, it's if, got a lot of ifs. If and like such I a thing st- as hyperfertility exists, and if there was a treatment, these are not things that are in the real world as far well, as Well, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert in this area. Oh, and okay. I also, you'd have to um, look at a particular treatment and say, does this particular one accord with other moral principles? Yeah. Okay, uh, Derek asks this. Uh, Jesus is against self-defense. Christians are not allowed to defend themselves. Apparently, this is a popular theory uh, by atheists. Yeah. So the premise that Jesus is against self-defense is erroneous. I understand why someone might think that because he himself went to the cross knowingly and willingly. Yeah. But that's because he had a special mission. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, that, you know, if anyone strikes you on one cheek, give him the other. I understand how you could get the idea of no self-defense out of that. But the larger point he's making is be generous. Don't press your rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's using hyperbole. In that passage, we know that he's not opposed to self-defense because if you look at uh, for a variety of reasons, but very concretely, you look in Luke's gospel in the passion narrative at the Last Supper, he says, "Okay, previously I sent you out two by two just with no provisions for yourself. But now things are going to get dangerous. Now let him who has not a sword sell his cloak and buy one. Yeah. So a sword is an an implement of self-defense. It's the ancient equivalent of a gun. Mm -hmm. So this is like Jesus saying things are getting dangerous. If you don't have the means of self-protection, go buy a gun. Right. That's would be the modern equivalent. And so uh, Jesus is clearly not opposed to self-defense. You can't just isolate his own situation or an individual comment he made elsewhere. You need to look at all of what he had to say. And he he articulates the principle of self-defense. Um, uh, but then there's the thing about live by the sword, die by the sword. That's yep. n- he's not talking about self-defense there. He's talking about living by the sword. Right. He's talking yeah. about being aggressive and and being an aggressor as opposed to a defender. All right. All right. Because defenders don't just live by the sword. People who live by the sword are like soldiers, bandits, brigands, people who deliberately put themselves in violent situations. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Thanks very much, Derek. All right, Jimmy, those are some great questions and answers. What's going to be the subject of our next episode? Next episode, we're going to be doing a patron-requested episode on curses. What are curses? How worried about them do we have to be? And if you think you're under a curse, what do you need to do to get out from under it? Excellent. Well, folks, you can send us your feedback by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.